everyone. Our service is going to start in about two minutes. Our worship team is coming to lead you in worship, and Pastor Troy is starting a brand new series called Listen Like Jesus. Listening to others in our world has become difficult. We live in a world that has a lot to say, and listening is something that people have a tough time doing. I hope over these next few weeks, we all become better listeners. Hope to see you back here in two minutes. Welcome to our online service. My name is Becky and I am the new middle school pastor. I want to welcome those of you who are new. If this is one of your first times tuning in, or you just want to let us know you are watching, or if you've been around for a while but have some questions about our church or about Jesus, we want to help out. All you have to do is go to our clcc.ca webpage, click the connect button, and we'll do our best to get back to you. If you're new and you live in the area and fill out that card, we would love to offer you a free gift. So click that connect button and the next time you find yourself at our Abbotsford or Aldergrove campus, we'll have a gift waiting for you. All week at our Abbotsford campus, we are hosting our God Squad Musical Camp, where the kids will be working on their lines, lyrics, and their leaping. Leaping is really just dancing. We did our best to find another L word. Maybe we should have thought harder. The performance is this Friday at 6.30 p.m. at our Abbotsford campus, and you are all invited to come and support our cast and choir. We are one church in multiple locations. At our Abbotsford campus, we are heading into new service times starting August 29th, and they will be at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Note the slight change from the times they've been over the last few months. If everything COVID-related stays where it is, it looks like we will be in heading into phase four here in BC. If that happens, our Aldergrove campus will be back at Betty Gilbert School on September 12th. It will be so nice to be back in that familiar setting. Our Aldergrove campus is still meeting in different locations during August. So check out our website to learn more about where and when we are meeting. Thank you again for your continued financial support over the past months. Lives have been changed because of your generous donations. You can always give online through our website at clcc.ca slash give. Let's pray for our service today. Father God, thank you so much that we can gather today and worship you, whether online or in person, wherever we are, Father. We are so blessed. We pray that the words that Pastor Troy speaks would impact our hearts, God, and that we would be changed after today's message. In your name, amen. Here is the gospel reading for today. Hello, this is Lim's family, and today's lesson is John chapter 6, verse 35 and 41 through 51. John 6 is 35. Then Jesus declared, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, 
and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. John chapter 6, verse 41. At this, the Jew there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I'll raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophet, They will all be taught by God. God, everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestor ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die, and the living bread that came down from the heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I'll give the life of the word. This heart open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear me cry, I will bring. Joy to say your 
Today, we are starting a brand new series on listening. We understand that listening is hard, isn't it? We all like to think that we're really good listeners, but in reality, we might hear, but we don't understand. I know there's a huge difference between hearing and understanding. Listening to understand is different than just letting others talk, so you have time to think about what you're going to say next. Over the next few weeks, we are going to learn to listen like Jesus. We want to take a look at how Jesus took time with people that he encountered. I think we'll find that he not just listened to them for facts, but he listened to them to truly understand what they were really saying. Maybe to start off, let me give you my definition of listening. Listening is more than hearing, it's understanding. Listening is more than hearing, it's understanding. I can listen to someone talk and do what the experts call active listening. You know, nod my head, lean in and do the play. Hmm but not understand a word they're saying if they're talking in another language. We can't truly understand someone just by hearing their words. We need to know where their words are coming from. We need to know the meaning of those words because even when they say words, they can mean different things, can't they? It's not even when someone talks in another language. Even even the English language is tough to know exactly what someone is saying without the context. It was about a year ago, I did something that I thought was quite impressive. And some of you are surprised by that. (laughs) I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was good enough to tell someone about it. So I told Andrea, my wife, and she responded with three words, good job, genius. I know, right? How should I take that? It, it, It took me back. Was that a good job, genius? Or was that a good job, genius? Do you hear the difference? Andrea isn't one to put me down and call me names, so it took me back just a bit. Was she saying I did a good job? Or was she saying that I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer and I might not even be near the drawer? The problem was she was using the exact same words. Andrea wasn't putting me down. She was giving me a a compliment. It just took me a few seconds to realize it. Listening is even... Listening is even more than hearing words. It's understanding where those words are coming from. So during this series, we're, we're going to look for ways to really listen to those who are around us, people that we see every day. Last week, I mentioned that Jesus was a great storyteller. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at how he was a great listener too. And we can learn from Jesus' conversations with people on how to listen well. Because it appears that today we have entered an era where there is a crisis in listening. There's a lot of noise and we're all very self-focused to the detriment of our spiritual and even our physical well-being. So what if? What if we learned to really listen? Not just for information and facts, but to really understand the other person. So let's look at a story today at 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 Jesus running into a guy named Nathaniel. Nathaniel is someone who doesn't really believe that Jesus is even the Messiah. And and he even goes out of his way to insult Jesus' hometown. But we'll find out that Jesus did not get after him for the insult. Jesus turned around the conversation by listening to knowing someone. He listened to know him and he actually made a follower. But before we look at that, let's take a close look at what happened just before this encounter. We're going to be looking uh, at the first chapter of John, right at the beginning of John. John is the fourth book in the New Testament. It's another perspective of what someone really close to Jesus saw and heard as Jesus walked and met with different people. You can turn there now in your Bibles or log on to your uh, YouVersion apps, and we will be in John chapter 1. Before we jump into our story, let's just back this story up just a little bit. Because for centuries, leading up to this time, the Jewish people had been waiting for a Messiah, someone to come and save them. This is the promised one. And John starts the story about Jesus with another guy named John. And I know there's two Johns. I'll try and keep them separate for you. The people called this other John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the first prophet that God had sent in a long time. John the Baptist gets things restarted with this idea that the Messiah is coming. John the Baptist is in the wilderness with this simple message. And it's, and it's this, repent, turn from your sins. <laughs> repent, turn from your sins. Because God is up to something. And if you don't change your mind, you might miss out what God is about to do. 
the crowds that John attra- uh, John the Baptist attracted were so large that some people even thought that he was the Messiah. The religious leaders one day came up to him and asked, are you the one that we're looking for or is there someone else? When the John the Baptist was asked this question, he, this is how he answered it. I'm not even worthy to untie up, untie the, the Messiah sandals. I can't even be a servant. So just to be clear, John's saying, I am not the one. So one day, John the Baptist is hanging out with some of his followers and Jesus starts walking towards them. That day, John the Baptist looks at Jesus and this is what he says, look, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. To me, that's an odd thing to randomly say. John's saying, you know the guy that I've been talking about, the guy who was here before me but isn't here yet, he'll be here after me. And the people around him are probably looking around to make sure they're not the only ones who don't really get what John is thinking and talking about. They might be saying, well, that makes, that makes no sense, John, but keep talking. John's saying, the person that I deny being, well, there he is. That's the guy. John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Messiah and immediately starts to lose some followers. So let's pick up this story and see what those new followers start doing in John chapter 1, verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the men who heard that John the Baptist, what what John had said and followed Jesus. This is John the Baptist, 41. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Now check out what Andrew did. He found his brother and said, we have found the Messiah. Now, if you were Simon, what would you have said to your brother? They've been waiting for a long time. If you were Andrew, how would you convince Simon that it was really him, really the Messiah? I think we've all done something like this before. When we've had an extraordinary experience, we have to tell others about it. When you experience something extraordinary, you tell your friends, you tell your family, you tell your coworkers, and you say something like this, you're never going to believe what I just experienced. How do you tell your friends about something that changes you? Or something so amazing, it's really beyond words. You know, maybe it's the first time you were on a cruise ship. How do you describe that? You say things like, well, it was like the biggest and most luxurious hotel that I've ever been in and seen, but it floats. (laughs) You can tell your friends about the elevators, the theaters, the water slides and the pools. You can tell them about the sink, toilet and shower that they've engineered into a a four foot square room. (laughs) You can tell them about the amazing food, but until you're on the ship, It's hard to describe, isn't it? How do you describe the Grand Canyon to someone who's never seen a picture of it? You can use all the descriptive words. You can say it was breathtaking. It was huge. All you could see was this massive canyon. But how can you describe a big hole in the ground that's 450 kilometers long? For them to actually get what you are saying, they have to see it themselves. I'm sure that's what Andrew was facing when he was trying to get when he was trying to tell Simon about Jesus. How can you describe a person who they've been waiting for thousands of years? Every generation leading up to them had been praying for this person who had this huge promise. Now they found him. Andrew went and got Simon and brought him to Jesus. Do you know why he brought him to Jesus? Because what can you say? to convince someone who the Jewish people have been waiting for years that he is there in their hometown. The Messiah is there. What is he going to say? Really, all he could say is this, just come with me. (laughs) You are not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. So you might as well just come, just come and see. Jesus's first followers became his followers because of an invitation to come and see. Let's pick the story up in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. Now, we often read this and don't think much of it, but this was 100 kilometers away. That's like walking to Bellingham and back. It's like a 19-hour hike. So Jesus went, the, the scriptures say, he found Philip and said to him, come, follow me. Just so we're clear, every single person up to this point has had something change within them, not because they just met someone, but because they were seen. This wasn't an experience something. It was an experience, someone. They, they had experienced someone that they couldn't explain. Experiencing someone is seeing them. It's that deep connection. They discovered something that I think we've discovered, that Jesus needs to be experienced, not explained. Maybe a great way for, for, for people to experience Jesus is to learn to listen to others, really listen so that they too can experience Jesus. So before this trip, verse 45, 
Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip finds Nathanael and Philip says, you want to go on a hundred kilometer hike with this guy from Nazareth who uh, might be the Messiah? Philip re reacts in a way that you and I might react with, like, what in the world? <laughs> I'm not walking with a total stranger who thinks that he's the Messiah for 100 kilometers. <laughs> you know, that's a special kind of crazy. Besides, don't you know anything? Come on, you know nothing good comes from that part of the world. But Philip really wants Nathaniel to meet Jesus. But Nathaniel is skeptical. Philip wants Nathaniel to come on his trip with them. So he thinks, how do I explain this to him? I've just spent the entire day with this Jesus and I know that he's worth following so much so that I'm willing to take a hundred kilometer walk with him, spend time with him. Really, the only way I can describe it is amazing, never seen before. Now I could spend the rest of my day trying to convince him with my words, explain who Jesus is, but it's not going to convince him. How do I convince him? How do you convince him? When you come across something that's so unique, so different, that when you explain it to your friends that there are no words, Philip nails it with what comes next. This is what he says. Come and see for yourself. Verse 47, as they approach, Jesus says, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Some versions say an honest man. Jesus was giving him a compliment. What Nathaniel says next, I find interesting. He says this, how do you know about me? How do you know where I come from? How do you know what I'm like? Jesus replied, I could see you. I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. I could see you. Verse 49, then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Now before, Nathanael had a tough time believing who Jesus was, and that's changed. That was a quick transformation from asking, what good comes from Nazareth to declaring that you are the son of God, the king of Israel? Even saying that someone was the son of God would have been, would have been saying something blasphemous. Saying anyone that was saying saying anyone was king of Israel apart from the actual king would be thought to be an act of insurrection. Something changed his mind. He's living dangerously just saying those words. Something drastic changed. So what convinced him? I I think that it was Jesus knowing him and understanding him, listening to where he came from, understanding the things that he struggled with. Jesus seeing him. Listening is seeing people and understanding them. I really believe that Nathaniel wanted to be seen. He wanted to hear that someone saw him. Nathaniel asks, how do you know about me? And Jesus says, I can see you. I think that when Jesus was saying, I can see you, it's a lot more than just physically seeing his body. I think that Jesus physically saw him, but I think it had to be more. Now, if you grew up in church, you might push back and say, but Troy, this is Jesus we're dealing with. He's got a direct line with God. You know, this God who knows everything. And I'll give you that. Jesus probably had a gift to pick up on these little things a little quicker than people who weren't the son of God. But I think we could also see life change and do the same with a little bit of time and good listening skills and see people. We see life change through Jesus seeing Nathaniel. Not just listening to him, but taking the next step and knowing him, knowing where he came from, his journey to where he is at this moment. Seeing was more than I just see you physically there. Here's another way that English language gets, kind of gets in the way. You know, I think that it had to be that deep connection. That, that, that deep connection, like when you, when you take an emotion to a friend, maybe it's a hurt or a joy, and they just don't hear the information. They join you in your emotion. And isn't that great? This is why we invite people to weddings and graduations and funerals. We want to see them. We want to join them with the emotion that they are feeling. And in that moment, if we're the ones celebrating or we are the ones mourning, we feel heard. We feel seen. What does it look like for you to listen to others, for them to be seen? So for us to truly listen to the people around us, it takes more than just hearing them. It takes seeing them. So 
What does it look like to see someone? Seeing is asking them how they're really doing before you tell them about your day. Seeing is not picking up your phone when you're in a conversation with someone. When you're in a conversation with someone and you pick up your phone, you are telling the person that you are in the room with that they're not as important as the people who aren't there. <laughs> in my family, we love our phones, but we know that real people are better. There are times we put our phones away so that we can be with the people who are actually there to listen to them, to see them. It is so much easier to listen and see others when there's not a phone in our hands. Now, my family isn't perfect, but we're working on listening and seeing each other better. Seeing is asking a question when you don't understand what your friends really are saying. There might be something that is that's not quite connecting for you. The worst questions are the ones that are never asked. If there's something that is said that might concern you, someone says something you want to dig a little deeper in, something where, where you see a spark in your friend's eye that says, this is something that I'm interested in. I'm interested in. Ask the follow-up question. Phrases like, I'm just not feeling myself today. Or the obvious one, like, work was hard today. Tell me more should be something to say to help us to listen like Jesus and see them. So what would it take for you to listen like Jesus when you're talking to people? What would it take for them to be seen and heard? Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful for this story where Jesus came up to Nathaniel and he saw him and he knew him and Nathaniel felt heard. So Jesus, I pray that even this week that we might learn to listen like Jesus, that we might be ones who are really seeing people in our lives. They just wouldn't be, we wouldn't see them what they're wearing, but we would see what they're feeling and how they're reacting to life. Pray this in Jesus name. Amen. In a moment, there is going to be a question pop up on your screen. Uh, I'd like you to take a minute and discuss it with those around you, or think about it yourself if you're watching this by yourself. The question today is this, what one thing can you do to show people that you are listening to them by seeing them? I'll be right back after the band sings a song with us. Don't forget what it was that Jesus did to turn Nathaniel around. When Nathaniel said in verse 48, how did you know me? Remember, this is how the first followers of Jesus became followers of Jesus. Andrew, who knew Peter, invited him. Philip, who knew Nathaniel and invited him. Jesus knowing all of them and inviting all of them to experience something new. Nathaniel asks, how did you know me? Jesus responds, I could see you. I don't know how our friends would take it. If after every conversation we had with him, we said, I hear you and I see you. Now you might not want to say that, but I sure hope that they feel that. I hope they know that you see what they're feeling, experiencing and wrestling with, and you hear the struggle that they're facing. That only comes when we learn to listen like Jesus. What would it look like for you to take a week and truly listen like Jesus? Listen to the needs of the people that want to be seen. Our doxology for this series is found from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 14. 
Now may the Lord, may, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great week. Hope to see you back here next week. Thank you for tuning in for today's service. If you have any questions about what was spoken in the sermon or about CLCC, we would love to hear from you. Go to our website where you'll find a response button on the homepage. We would love to connect with you, talk with you, pray with you, and answer any questions you might have. We'd love to keep in touch this week if you haven't already followed us on social media. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook. There you can see how we are making an impact in the Fraser Valley. Right now, the children's lessons are about to start. So kids, get ready. For the rest of you, have a wonderful week. Goodbye.
good to see you today. I have this paper that describes a perfect world. I want you to imagine with me the most beautiful world with big gardens full of luscious green trees with lots of delicious fruit growing on them. Now look at this paper. It's a picture, but it describes a beautiful world. Now I'm going to rip the paper in half. When the first humans disobeyed God, it was like this ripped paper. What was perfect became broken. Thank goodness we have a God who continues to repair our broken world. That's our big idea this week. God promised to fix what was broken. God loves everything he created, even the people who mess up and don't do the things God wants them to do. We know from reading more in the Bible that God had a plan all along for fixing people's relationship with God, the one that was broken when Adam and Eve disobeyed. That's who God is. How would you react if someone broke something you cared a lot about? Probably not in a good way, but God reacts differently. God is willing to fix what is broken because God is a gracious, compassionate, slow to anger and loves us that much. Now, our memory verse for this month is from Joshua 21 verse 45. Let's say it together. Ready? Stand up with me and we're going to do the actions. It goes like this. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you keep your promises. And God, I pray that we will trust in you to keep your promises to us for all the great and amazing things that you do for us. Amen. We are really excited about our musical camp starting tomorrow for all the kids that have registered. It's going to be so much fun. Now, let's see what our friends from GROW have to tell us about how amazing God is. See you later. Hello, everybody. So glad you could be here. And boy, do I have a surprise for you. I want you to meet someone who is very special to me. I was walking through the park one day, and in the middle of the sidewalk, there was this beautiful egg. I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. But what I did know is that if he stayed on that sidewalk, he would get hurt. So I took him home. So I present to you, Eduardo. Say hello, Eduardo. He's shy. What's that? Oh, stop. They're gonna love you. He's a little shy. Don't worry, Eduardo. There's no reason to be shy. Carl? Hey, Cassie. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, I'm feeling okay. Why do you ask? Really? I mean, you're talking to an egg. Oh, Cass. Not just any old egg. This is Eduardo. Eduardo? Yes, ma'am. He's the cutest little egg in the world. Not only is a one in a million egg, he's a one in a dozen. Okay. Did you give him that name? Sure did. Thought of it myself. You like it? Sure. It's interesting. Well, I mean, it wasn't my first choice. You want to hear the other names I thought of? Not really. Great. So at first I thought of Shelly because of the chill. Then I thought that wasn't strong enough of a name. Then I thought of Yoko. Scarlett Yoke Hamilton. Thomas Egison, Egna, Yolanda, Lil Yoki, Edgar Allan Poe, Egg Sharon, Egg Xavier, and Greg. Greg? Yeah, like Gur Egg. Nice. So what now? Are you guys like best friends now? We are. When we found each other, just linked like two childhood friends who knew each other since like, well, childhood. Not gonna lie, that's a little weird. Cassie, you wouldn't understand. It's an egg thing. I guess. You should have seen me. We are playing catch just like the old days. What old days? Back when I used to play baseball. You never played baseball. Oh yeah, I forgot. <gasps> Harry, take a deep breath. Okay? Eduardo! I dropped him! I'm a terrible person! Carl, you're not a terrible person. Yes, I am. No way. You're nice, you're funny, and you make videos that crack people up all the time. I do? Yeah. 
I make people crack up all the time. Oh, I, I didn't Just mean Just like it. how it cracked at Guardo. <laughs> Listen, Carl, I think we should talk about this week's story. <sighs> What's the point? Well, I think it'll make you feel better. Really? Really. Remember the beginning of the Bible where God created the universe? Yeah, I do remember that. That was awesome and perfect. It was, and on the sixth day of creation, God created the first two humans ever, Adam and Eve. And they were pretty perfect too. They were. It was all created the way God wanted it to be. But something bad happened. <gasps> oh no. There was a bad snake that lied to Adam and Eve. And after God had made everything, the Bible talks about a serpent talking to Adam and Eve. A serpent? Like a snake? Why would they talk to a snake? It's hard to say, but the serpent was very clever. You see, snakes represented the presence of evil or chaos in the world, and that's what the serpent wanted. He wanted Adam and Eve to doubt themselves and want something else, something they knew God didn't want for them. So they listened to the serpent, which no longer made them perfect as God created them. That's horrible. This is a sad story. Sure was, but later, in Genesis chapter 3, God made a promise. What promise did God make? God promised that even though people are no longer perfect, God's ways would always be, and that God could make what was broken whole again. So God promised to fix what was broken? Yep. And you want to know some good news? I love some good news. You just said our big idea. <gasps> Today's big idea is God promised to fix what was broken. That's right. On the count of 100, no, three, we're all going to say it together. Ready? One, two, three. God promised to fix what is broken. Woohoo! All right. Good job, everyone. Yeah. So, how are you feeling now, Carl? <sighs> Better. It hurts seeing something that I love broken, but it's cool to know that God can fix things that are broken. Plus, having an egg as a best friend can be really tough. I guess you could say it isn't all that it's cracked up to be. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week, kids.